Hey everyone, thanks for joining. My name is Zach Oliva. I'm a partner at Key Favor and Oliva LLP, uh, calling in from Houston, Texas. Um, real quick, uh, you can put your questions for a Q&A at the end in the chat or the question panel uh, in the dialog box. And if you have any uh, technical difficulties, email events at kolawllp.com and Andrea, um, who's our marketing coordinator, will make sure to uh, get those addressed. So again, welcome everyone to our webinar today, which is an oil market update. I wanna thank everyone for spending time with us today. Um, these have certainly been interesting times in the oil and gas industry. COVID was the third downturn in my you know, career. And just when I was getting comfortable and grateful for average oil prices, here, here we are at over 100, I think uh, WTI is around 105 today. Um, you know, Josh and I had dinner last night and we joked that, you know, a year ago, who the heck would have thought that oil over $100 uh, would be feel normal. But based on his fund's performance and having learned more from his writings and talks over the last few years, uh, I have a suspicion that Josh had an idea of where we were headed. So while our firm and our attorneys are experts in oil and gas law, we are not experts in the oil market. Um, so one of our clients asked us to seek out, you know, who's the best hedge fund manager uh, in the oil and gas industry. And Josh uh, gracefully uh, agreed to talk to us today. Uh, Josh Young is the founder and chief investment officer of Vice and Interest, which is a Houston based investment firm focused on publicly traded oil and gas companies. Uh, he was previously chairman of um, Chairman of the Board of Iron Bridge Resources, which was a publicly traded Canadian EMP. Uh, he took control of it, sold off non core assets, and sold it for a premium. Uh, prior to founding Bison, Josh was an energy investor at a hedge fund and a multi billion dollar family office, and an investment analyst at a private equity fund, and prior to that, a management consultant. Josh's commentary and ideas are regularly sought after by journalists, and he's been featured in places such as Reuters, The Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and The Financial Times. Additionally, uh, Barron's recently published an article about Josh titled, Oil Investor Who Made 390% Last Year Explains Three Stock Picks. So you should definitely read that article. Um, you can follow Josh on Twitter, uh, where he regularly hosts Twitter spaces uh, with other executives from the oil and gas industry. And his most recent Twitter space reached over a quarter of a million us users. And he also posts barbecue pictures on there, which are also great. Uh, so, Josh, I'll hand it over to you. And thank you again for uh, uh, spending time with us today. Great. Yeah, thank you, Zach. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. Uh, Kifa, Bernard, Leva, uh, the people that know them know that they do exceptionally well at oil and gas law. And um, I found that it's really helpful to kind of surround myself with people that do really well at what they do. And so it's really, it's an honor to, to get to, to speak with you and your clients, as well as others that may have joined this. So the goal for this, um, for this webinar is to uh, kind of give a brief update on the oil and gas market. And then from there to uh, answer various questions that people may have. So we'll try to keep this um, this very brief and somewhat high level while also sharing a few of the different indicators that we're looking at that I think are a little different from what you'll normally see in various investment bank or you know uh, newspaper or TV sort of overviews of the market. So um, there's a very uh, here. Let's see. I'm trying to. Um, there's a disclaimer, just, you know, none of this is investment advice. And if you're going to invest, please seek a, a financial advisor. Um, and then this is a, a background of myself. Zach, I think you did a really good job of that background. So I'll move on from here. And so um, a little bit about, uh, about us. So, you know, there's been reports about our performance. Can't talk about the fund performance, but what I can point to is the performance of individual equities that I've talked about on TV or um, in uh, newspaper interviews or so on over the last roughly 18 months. And here's how they've performed versus the oil and gas index. And so 
kind of like what I was talking about at the start, where I think it's really special to get to do this with Kefauver and Oliva, which is, has this excellent track record in oil and gas law. Um, I think it's really important to calibrate who you get information from because everything that you read and see is framed by someone in some way. And it's helpful to understand uh, what the uh, talent is or what the capabilities are of those who are framing the information that they're sharing in order to assess the relevance as well as quality of information that's being shared. So I think this is relevant for that perspective. Um, and, you know, it's really been awesome and kind of surreal to see to see this happen over the last 18 months. So there's a few things that uh, I think are, are misunderstood in the oil market that are worth addressing here for a couple minutes. So one is that um, while you might be hearing more about oil in the headlines, oil investment is actually quite low. And this is an easy measure of it. This is the price for oil versus the open interest. And it's actually gotten worse since this, uh, this is a dated report from Bloomberg from a week or two ago. The open interest is actually down since then. What normally happens is as price goes up, the number of uh, contracts betting on a commodity or on you know, a stock uh, goes up. Uh, I guess stocks that you don't necessarily see more shares, but you just see like more interest generally, more money flowing in. This is indicative of price rising while actually money is flowing out. And so that's a little unusual and worth noting because many people are worried about where we're at in this oil cycle and are noting that oil prices are higher than they were a year ago and much higher than where they were two years ago. And so it's important to kind of track this and sentiment is actually quite terrible for oil. And there's a lot of room for oil prices to go a lot higher as sentiment goes from terrible to less bad and maybe even to good given the very strong price performance for oil over the last little while. Similarly, um, another misconception is that we're in backwardation and the, in many uh, reports you see that that's bearish. They say, oh, well, the forward curve in the futures market says that oil is going to be $70 in two years or three years. That's wrong. I mean, that is what the forward curve says, but that's not a prediction of price. That's just where people will make a two-sided bet with you on where oil will be. It turns out that in timeframes like this, uh, it's more likely with an oil market in backwardation for price to actually rise, not fall. So the forward curve says oil is going down. The history says that when the forward curve says that, the actual price for oil goes up, not down. And then another sort of misunderstanding is people see these reports from the Energy Information Association. They see them from the IEA and you know various other, the, the presidential administration, various uh, sources and uh, news reports. Um, often they're wrong and biased. And so one of the most interesting things has been there were these inventory estimates for how much oil would be in inventory at the end in storage at the end of, I think this is for the end of 2022. And you can see every two months or so, the estimated oil remaining in storage has fallen by you know 50 plus million barrels. And so that means that the, um, the EIA in this case was, has structurally underestimated inventory declines by several hundred million barrels, which is enormous, and that's over a one-year period. So again, when you see these reports, it's very important, I think, to calibrate where they're coming from, the track record of those providing them, as well as what they're saying. And you know, they're just these pervasive misconceptions. There's many people providing information for various reasons, and it's important, I think, to understand who they are, what their track record is of those predictions or of those assessments, and then what their financial or other sort of incentives are uh, in that process. So in terms of the oil market today, uh, oil is very strong from a fundamental perspective. Demand is recovering from COVID low levels, um, from artificially low, from the government shutting things down and people choosing to not drive and not fly and so on. Um, and supply is not recovering as fast as demand. There is a very, very strong, like positive demand trajectory for oil and the supply trajectory is just not keeping up. And then as you can see on this chart, there is this long-term trajectory for oil where oil demand has been rising by about 1% a year on a global basis for the last several decades. And that trend has not been broken despite lots of talk and investment in alternative energy and lots of talk of uh, demand destruction and other sorts of things. 
So um, another sort of uh, indicator that's that's interesting that's tied to that is as demand exceeds supply, oil in storage is falling. And when measured as oil in storage per day's use, it's actually falling even more. And what you can see is in history, there's actually been a pretty good correlation in between oil and storage versus price and small movements of oil and storage have led to large movements in price. And what we're seeing is this very large movement in oil and storage and a relatively moderate movement in price. So there may be a lot more to come. And when you hear stories about uh, attribution for oil price movements or oil market movements to wars, to various other factors, taxes, whatever, this is this is what matters. What matters is that demand is in excess of supply. And you know, there's many different factors in both sides. But this is really kind of one of the important things to track in the oil market. And this tells you that most likely oil prices are rising considerably until the point where inventories stop declining and start to rise. Um, another factor there and a kind of big hidden, I guess, factor, at least in various uh, government agency models and various other models where people have just wanted to see oil prices go down, they've been ignoring that there's been this energy crisis in Europe and Asia. And this started in September of 2021. And the genesis of it was years earlier where various European and other countries chose to underinvest in fossil fuels and overinvest in less reliable alternative energy. And when there were any sorts of disruptions, there was the potential as they ramped that up uh, for energy supply to be insufficient. So that happened this fall and it's continued more or less. And what's happened is that oil is now being used for power generation in Europe and Asia. And this is extremely inefficient and it's also very bad for the environment and it's the result of some of these bad policies. It's very important because this is one of the biggest factors of extra demand for oil relative to models. And it also shows you that US natural gas is very, very mispriced, way too low, and that there is the potential subject to either additional exports or additional US activity for US natural gas prices to rebalance, maybe not quite as high, but to a level that's more indicative of kind of the global value of a BTU. So one of the other important kind of misconceptions along with fundamental facts is that higher prices are not killing demand. As prices for US gasoline have risen, um, demand for US gasoline has risen. And so, yeah, sure, maybe someone that you know might choose to drive a little less if gasoline prices are higher, but in aggregate, there's more demand even as prices are rising. This is a very important fact. It's something that a lot of economists that haven't spent time in the space miss. It's, it's functionally a gift and good where the higher the price goes, the more the demand is up until demand destruction. And so um, it's something I, I've interacted with a number of different bank economists and others who, again, they just aren't experts in this. They get this wrong repeatedly. I think it's much better to focus on the data than to focus on anecdotes. And the data is that demand is very strong and actually demand for March is even stronger. And there's been a narrative around, oh, it's spring break or what have you. But the reality is that this trend has been going on for a while where demand has been well in excess um, of supply. And so we're seeing inventories fall and we're seeing prices rise and we're not seeing demand getting affected by it. So another important factor here, one second, sorry, it's a uh, slide's lagging. Oh, there we go. Okay. So another important factor from a demand perspective is that um, a lot of the incremental demand isn't just in the US as driving is rebounding and air, air travel is rebounding. It's also that people in emerging and frontier markets, the poorest people are starting to use a little bit more oil and related hydrocarbons. And so as that happens, as you have the Indian farmers and um, sub-Saharan African farmers and what have you starting to use gas powered scooters and other sort of very low emission, very low energy consuming, but fossil fuel um, transportation and other sorts of uh, inputs, um, you see energy consumption rise a lot. And so there's really a lot of room for life to get better for some of the poorest people in the world. And 
Um, that's a, a big part of where oil demand has been rising. Again, it's been rising by a little over 1% a year for many decades, and that's a very good thing. It shows that people in some of the poorest countries in the world are actually getting a little less poor. Um, here, again, this is not... Great. Okay. So um, I'm just checking. Sorry, one second. Okay. Good. Um, so another thing that's been really interesting is like we saw with the oil futures information and the amount of uh, speculative interest in oil versus um, the price, um, as the speculative interest in oil equities has increased, the prices have still remained historically low. And you can see this as energy earnings are improving. Um, you are seeing kind of tech bubble type stocks collapsing, uh, relatively speaking. So you go back a year and some of the highest growth, highest, like most frothy companies, their stocks are down 80%, 90%. Um, but what you, what you see here is that the energy stocks and the index are still under 5% uh, when historically they got as high as 25% plus in the late 80s and if we went back to the 70s even higher. So there's a lot of room for oil and gas stocks to re-rate higher. There's still quite negative sentiment and it doesn't appear that the stock market is even beginning to price in the huge earnings improvements of these oil and gas stocks. So another way to show this is how much the stock market has risen since the last time oil was at the current price or around the current price. Uh, the general stock market, despite the pullback in growth stocks, is up about 145%. Oil is about flat over the last, what is it, seven years. And oil and gas stocks via the index XOP or the ETF XOP are down about 53%. So this is very uh, unusual for a recovery. And what you'd expect is that as oil continues to recover, oil and gas stocks could recover at least to perform in line with oil. And realistically over time, as they continue to increase their earnings and, and continue to outperform versus other sectors, there is room for oil and gas stocks to converge with the broader market on a multi-year and maybe multi-decade basis. Um, from a supply perspective, um, these are some of the factors that go into all of that. Um, there's been massive underinvestment in the industry, and this is well reported. Uh, partly it's driven by negative regulations and uh, taxes and other sorts of factors and pressure on banks to not lend as much to uh, oil and gas and other hydrocarbon focused companies, um, higher costs of capital and so on. And some of it's related to losses historically um, from the uh, oil and gas sector where investors are less interested in investing. You need a lot more spend on a global basis to see oil demand, or sorry, oil supply higher in order to match demand. And it's gonna likely actually take a number of years for this uh, investment to kick in before you'll see sufficiently high, um, before you'll see sufficiently high supply to match growing demand. And then, um, we're uh, lagging again. Um, sorry, next slide, please. So there's there's similar underinvestment in oil field services, and uh, that underinvestment means that um, it's going to take a while to ramp up the capacity to even absorb larger spend on the upstream side in order to increase production. So there is multiple kind of compounding factors that are preventing the oil and gas industry from growing as much as is needed to adequately supply the market today. Again, when you think about it, that means that supply is likely to continue to underwhelm versus demand. And that means that there's a reasonably good chance that we end up in a higher price environment for a longer period of time. So um, there are labor constraints as well that come along with down with uh, long downturns. This was from 2019. It's only gotten worse since then. And so as you have less experienced workers in the oil field, and as you have uh, more challenges with recruiting, and again, this is a big part uh, or a big way that government policy as well as just 
the way that the industry is treated by uh, leaders and politicians in the media, it really makes it hard to get the right people and keep the right people in the right jobs to be able to get stuff done. And you know, we're really suffering and, and challenged by that now. And this is one of the major factors that's going to prolong this downturn. Well, prolong this recovery. And because of such a long downturn, there's a reasonable shot at a prolonged recovery and upcycle. So um, another part of this is there were not anywhere close to where the U.S. rig count was um, in the last upcycle. And some of that has to do with efficiencies with new rigs, and a lot of it has to do with not having the people and not having the well-maintained equipment available to be able to drill more wells. Um, as you can see, there is a historical relationship in between oil price and the rig count, and that's been broken. And there should be some catch up over time, but it looks like what may be required is a much higher oil price for a lot longer. And there's another factor there with rigs, and I think it's indicative of some of the other problems that become exposed in an industry when there's been such a long downturn. So in this case, it's related to there being insufficient drilled uncompleted wells, basically oil field working capital. As that working capital has been essentially depleted, you need even more rigs in order to be able to sustain existing production and then even more rigs than that in order to actually grow production. So there's massive underinvestment now. You need more investment in order to just drill and to build enough rigs and maintain enough rigs and hire the right people in order just to sustain the current level of drilled uncompleted wells, basically to reinvest in the working capital necessary to get the industry productive enough to produce at a higher level. And so we're not seeing that investment. Even today, we're not seeing that investment. And you know, that probably means that prices need to be a lot higher such that that investment happens, such that supply capacity comes back on over the next multiple years. So one of the escape valves that's been cited, and this was something that we put out um, at Bison in September of last year, talked about it on a podcast a little bit before that, and then put out a follow-on report in October of last year, and we got slammed for it. I mean, people really hated it. They'll still sometimes say we're wrong, even though you can see this chart and we need to update this with a few more months that have further confirmed this and uh, month to date so far, apparently for March, it's even worse. OPEC and OPEC plus have not delivered based on their claimed spare capacity. So either they're choosing to spike oil prices at a time when this may end up eventually resulting in demand destruction, which is off strategy for them, or they just don't have the spare capacity that they claimed. So, you know, take your pick, but it does look as prices continue to rise and as supply continues to disappoint, it does look increasingly likely that there just isn't that spare capacity. And this is very important because as OPEC is out or runs out of spare capacity, there we remove this safety valve from the market. And so this is something fairly unique for the oil market where for many decades, there's been more than enough supply and it's just a question of at what price will OPEC bring more on. This is a new paradigm to some extent, and I know that's a very scary thing to say and is often <laughs> followed by things collapsing. Um, in this case, I think we're, we have a good line of sight for multiple years of this new paradigm where there's not this sort of cushion for the oil market. And again, just looking at this across different months and then across producers, there's really, I mean, it's just, it's looking tough. And then that's even before factoring in any sort of supply disruption from Russia and Kazakhstan and other countries that may have some disruption because of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and related sanctions. So with that, tried to keep it short. Apologies for the couple of, uh, uh, slide uh, challenges. Um, happy to uh, keep in touch. Uh, easy to find me, and uh, you know we're available through a lot of different formats. To to if you want to follow up, Josh, uh, that was wonderful, and uh, I thought you really touched on stuff that was really timely. Uh, but also, I mean, you, you're you're great at just really cutting through a lot of the noise that we hear today. Um, and focusing on the data and the facts. And we actually had a few questions um, from folks that uh, uh, I thought you know had some really good questions. So 
the first question is from Kevin. How do you expect China and global COVID lockdowns to affect global demand moving forward? Um, so it looks like there's a trend towards fewer lockdowns over time. Lockdowns as a policy seem to have failed, and it's just a question of what's actually driving lockdown behavior at this point. And you know, there's a number of different experts that we rely on and work closely with to assess this particular risk, and those experts are not worried. And so they've done a good job of anticipating uh, I wish I had worked with them sooner. Um, they've done a good job of anticipating various other waves and lockdowns and so on. And so just based on the data, this doesn't, this seems to be something more internal uh, from a political perspective for China. And recent lockdowns in China have been very short. So lots of worry, lots of news, and some in some cases panic in the market. And then very shortly thereafter, followed by much higher oil demand and higher prices. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, thanks for that. Joe had a question. Uh, it said, thank you, Josh. Many analysts and talking heads are starting to speak louder about a pending recession or worse in late 2022 and into 2023. What effects, if any, will a recession or even depression have on oil and gas prices, given everything that you've discussed with inventory shortages, lack of capital investment, and supply and demand implications? It's a great question. So first of all, um, the, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, uh, someone said, you know, rumors of my demise have been overstated. So, um, you know, analysts my death forecast, have been greatly exaggerated. Yeah, analysts have forecast 20 out of the last two recessions. Maybe they've they forecast 50. So um, I, I'm not trying to be cavalier about it, but again, like I'm an economist by training and economists are terrible and analysts are even worse at forecasting recessions. So when everyone's talking about a recession, you should start thinking about, hey, things might be getting better. Um, and when no one's talking about recessions, that's when you should be worried a little bit. Again, just from personal experience and observing over a long time, um, you know, in a recession, I think from what my understanding is of the current setup in the global economy, it is more likely that we end up in a sort of stagflationary environment than a deflationary environment. And what that means is that if we have a slowdown in economic activity and maybe coinciding with a rise in prices, not a fall in prices. And we've been in a deflationary environment for a while, mostly driven by demographics and also from way overinvestment from a prior cycle where we overinvested in the last commodity cycle and demographics rolled over. So what we're in right now is a situation where there's been such material underinvestment and such disbelief that prices would ever be higher that we've burned the furniture like we saw with drilled uncompleted wells. I picked on that as well as labor because those are kind of the easiest things to understand. If you have a thousand wells that you've drilled and not completed and now you have 200, you know, you got an issue. If you had a huge workforce that was really talented and really experienced, and now a lot of those people are doing construction or various other sort of skilled labor um, in other industries at very high compensation levels with much less cyclicality. I mean, these are easy to understand things, but there's problems across the board. And so that sort of supply constraint um, relative to strong demand independent of price to some extent makes me think that to the extent that we end up in a recession, which I think is not a sure thing at all. Um, and again, the more people that say it, the less likely it is. Um, the To the extent that we end up in that, it seems much more likely we end up in a stagflation environment than a deflation environment. Gotcha, excellent. Um, another uh, viewer asked, if the Biden administration succeeds in closing a deal with Iran, does the notion of Iranian sanctions being lifted and those Iranian barrels coming into the market make you more bearish on oil? Uh, no. And, so and I guess tied into that would be, you know, any potential deals with, uh, you know, maybe Venezuela moving forward as well. Fr frankly, we need the oil that we can get out of Iran and Venezuela. Um, unfortunately, uh, it seems like our values are very important in some places and much less important in other places. So it's a very kind of complicated thing as someone that tries to do things based on values and not just expediency. Um, so it's a very conflicting thing to say for me, but we do like economically need that oil and we're not getting it. And it takes a very long time to the extent that sanctions are lifted to get more oil. At the same time, 
Iran is a huge country which had an amazing economy and was a very wealthy place for a long time. And I think that there's a good case, and Venezuela was too, there's a good case that in initial stages of those countries' recoveries, you could actually see incremental consumption locally exceed incremental oil production as tremendous investment to the extent that they change, right? Pretend like Venezuela became a full free democracy tomorrow, right? It's not happening, unfortunately, brutal dictatorship, terrible. But if, if it was a democracy tomorrow and it had a free market that opened up and privatized, that boom, that economic boom associated with it would likely increase consumption far more than the near-term increases in oil production uh, that could happen. Gotcha. So it seems to me that your argument is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but just to summarize it, it's that the, um, yes, the price is high relative to where it was maybe a year ago, but there are these huge structural challenges that the oil and gas faces as a whole, and therefore this price really isn't that high when you take into those into account those structural challenges. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, one of the viewers, uh, Blaine, asked as part of that, um, so what level of global, say, EMP CapEx would it take to get the global markets in balance? Um, I think you probably need to see kind of 2012 to 2014 levels over a multi-year period. And it might take as long as um, not even the first oil, but you know, oil for years of incremental supply from offshore fields coming on. And so um, it's really hard to tell, but a lot more money for a long time for the market to get back into balance. And so where does that capital come from? Especially in, in, a, in an era of, as you, you know, pointed out in one of your slides, severe underinvestment along with this ESG, I guess, narrative? Um, you know, it's going to have to come from either the industry making so much money from their oil production that it's highly economic for them to grow. And that means less re regulation, fewer taxes, and probably much, much higher oil prices and or from institutions that have sworn to never invest in oil and gas again, breaking their commitments and virtue signaling and unvirtue signaling, admitting that they were wrong, and then investing at much, much higher prices than where they sold previously. So both of those are kind of hard. And that's, I think, part of the problem that is driving oil prices much higher. Which I think you actually recently pointed out um, that there are ESG funds that have broken their promise uh, that they previously swore off oil and gas, and now they're investing in, uh, I guess, Russian oil um, and some other initiatives. Um, Andres asked the question, do you foresee forced shut-ins from lack of storage in Russia, and what are the longer-term consequences of um, I guess, lack of storage in Russia. So, so I, I kind of said it a couple of times, this is all assuming that Russian oil is uninterrupted. To the extent that, and like part of my logic for that is that it's very hard to get good information right now on the war in Ukraine, as well as on Russian oil exports. And there's a lot of conflicting reports. And I'm not saying it's not happening, what my goal is, is to present a base case that if there are no or very few disruptions to Russian oil supply and Kazakhstan oil supply and so on, this is what happens to oil, which is that it probably goes higher because it's structurally undersupplied. To the extent that Russian oil is shut in, yeah, older fields tend to do very poorly when you shut them in and then turn them back on. I mean, we saw this in the US, there was a lot of production that got shut in and when it turned back on, it was disappointing relative to where the production levels were before. And it requires a lot of investment in order to get mm -hmm. production and time to get production back up. So, and especially with some of the Russian fields, not to get too technical, but some of them are very conducive to permanent loss of production. So that would make oil even more scarce and require even higher prices. I guess my message is you don't need that for oil to go a lot higher. 
And I think that just kind of exaggerates or exacerbate, uh, exacerbates is probably a better word, um, the problem and means that oil needs to go even higher. And so the more things get worse for Russia, the more likely it is that you get oil prices to a point where you actually, they you shift gasoline from a given good where the higher the price is, the more demand there is, eventually you end up at a point where you just have people actually on a global basis using less oil and right. that may require 200 plus dollars a barrel for oil for a while and yeah. that's terrible for the global economy it's really really bad and tragic for the poorest people in the world and it's amazing for oil producers and so you know and it's something i guess i didn't say in the presentation but i've actively been funding through multiple different companies that have raised money recently, additional development in oil and gas, because I think that this is a real problem. And I think it's an ethical problem in addition to a financial problem. I think I'll make money on those investments, but I think it's also the right thing to do to the extent that there's highly economic oil development to do. I think it's the right thing to do also because not doing it, the people that get hurt the most are the poorest and the least able to take care of themselves. Gotcha. Um, well, it seems to me that, you know, that's why I, I am focusing on your, your structural argument and the, the misbalance between supply and demand, because it seems to me like um, the Iran question, the war in Ukraine or the conflict, you know, between Russia and Ukraine, these are kind of just like flies in the room compared to this big structural historic underinvestment, you know, in the oil and gas industry. Uh, but those are probably the questions that you get the most, which is how does this recent event affect oil prices? And it sounds to me like the answer is, yeah, it might, but it doesn't even matter because here's the really big problem over here, which were your slides. Yeah, um, the, the biggest, I'll, I'll address the biggest question I've gotten recently, and it's kind of annoying, but I'll, I'll take it seriously and I'll address it just because I've been asked it probably 50 times in the last two weeks uh, through various formats. Um, which is, will the U.S. Uh, enact an oil export ban? And if it does, what happens to oil prices and to U.S. oil producers? And it seems very unlikely that that happens, despite various talking heads and ostensible experts claiming that it's definitely happening. It seems very unlikely because the U.S. is actually not a net oil exporter, which means that if we mess up our local price, for oil, we're going to end up having to import enough oil based on the global price for oil that our gasoline may actually go up in price, not down. And people forget we don't consume oil. We consume gasoline. We consume diesel. <laughs> we consume jet fuel. We, we don't consume. Yeah. What's that? We consume the products of the oil. Exactly. And so you need to understand what's going into the gasoline you're consuming as a U.S. consumer. And I think, you know, I have lots of problems with energy policy in the U.S. and elsewhere and have for a while. It's not a political thing. It's a policy thing. Um, I, there's not evidence that there's been any policies in the U.S. for many years that there's not evidence that they've ever intentionally increased the price of gasoline in the short term every policy implemented for a very long time that I can tell. And again, like if I'm wrong, please, you know, find me, contact me, let me know where I missed it. But it looks like almost every policy for a long time has been uh, price negative for gasoline in the short term. And that makes it extremely unlikely. And again, there's, I think this presumption of incompetence, presumption of whatever, and I'm, I might disagree with a lot of the longer term and even medium term impacts of various energy policies in the U S and elsewhere, but, in the short term, these policies have been one-sided in terms of trying to push U.S. gasoline, U.S. diesel, et cetera, prices down to win political favor or whatever, or to spur economic growth. And this would not, an export ban would not be price negative for gasoline, for U.S. gasoline. And so um, it just is a very, it's something that talking heads might talk about, uh, various non-oil experts might talk about um, for other reasons, but it's just a very unlikely thing. Uh, based on how policy, again, watch it happen tomorrow, but like, you know, just so far based on how policy has been implemented, I might not agree with it, but there's at least been a pattern and the pattern is this other thing that makes it very unlikely. Right. Um, Andrew asked, 
OPEC recently estimated that there has been an approximately 600,000 barrel per day surplus in Q1, yet U.S. inventories have been dropping. Uh, could you please shed some light on this? Yeah, I mean, that's just wrong. Um, it's like the I showed that EIA chart where they just reset everything down over and over and over again. It's just wrong. They have different reasons to show that. Um, and that sounds actually like a little bit of a dated report. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the consensus has been shifting. Uh, we went into the year with consensus being that there'd be an oversupply for oil in 2022. And again, independent of Russia, there is an undersupply and there was going to be an undersupply of oil in 2022. Um, a different question from John, we know you run an equity fund, all other levels of the capital stack, uh, at other levels of the capital stack, might there be an opportunity for direct investment by pools of capital that are not constrained by ESG or other requirements? Yeah, I think it's just a question of like, where does the money come from? And we're not seeing evidence of incremental money versus 2019, 2018, and so on. We're actually still seeing capital leaving the sector in aggregate. So are there individual groups that may go fund some wells? Are there whatever? Sure, but is how does that look versus the aggregate investment in prior years? It looks down by a lot. So the, the impact of these pension funds and endowments and sovereign wealth funds divesting, and it's still going that direction. I mean, we saw uh, an insurance company last week announce, a major insurance company announced that they are no longer going to provide insurance for oil and gas operations. I imagine their investment group within that insurance to invest their insurance float has also either divested or is about to divest. We're seeing divestment active from giant pools of capital, and it's very hard to fight that trend. And so, you know, I think I think I, I talk about equities, but you can see it on the debt side, you can see it on the private investment side. It's just not, it's just not there relative to where it was for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, Ross asks a, a practical question. Uh, are transportation and delivery from the Permian Basin limited or stressed or at full capacity right now? Uh, gas is getting close in the Permian, and then there have been some earthquakes and some other issues. And um, so there are some infrastructure issues there. Um, there have been really unfortunately some uh, permitting issues from a federal basis to be able to get gas, natural gas, from places where it's produced to places where it's desperately needed, and to the point where we've seen giant electricity and other price spikes in places like Boston this winter. Um, and we're still seeing some very big dislocations driven by essentially federal anti-natural gas, anti-oil policies. And some of that infrastructure backup is in West Texas and New Mexico driven by insufficient allowed pipeline activity by the federal government. So these claims, hey, we're not doing anything, we're trying to help lower prices, it's just not true. And that's like one of many ways that that's uh, that that's illustrated. Interesting. Um, what does oil demand look like? Uh, this is a, a great question from Jeff. Uh, what does oil demand look like without COVID? Uh, oil demand would have grown on that sort of long-term trend, plus or minus a little bit. So there was this narrative that oil is going away based on government shutdowns of the world. And what was amazing was how much oil demand there was despite government shutdowns of the world. And so, yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty remarkable how much demand there was. And then you can kind of tell how much demand there would have been based on how quickly demand is rising despite rising prices. So, you know, we would have probably grown by 1%-ish a year, just like we have for a very long time from a world demand perspective. Um, we have two questions on, on windfall taxes, so I'll merge those together. Um, Tom asked, you know, if windfall taxes turn to action, how do you see domestic producers reacting to this? And Andres asked, along the same lines of the windfall taxes, um, what are the biggest risks for energy investors? Is it windfall taxes? Is it other government interventions? Is there a favorite country that you have to invest in? 
So I guess on the, on the windfall taxes, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's this uh, saying, um, the, uh, what is it, the, the declines will continue until supply improves. It's kind of a, a riff on another sort of a joke about how you fix something by causing more of the problem. So, you know, if there's a windfall tax, one, the one that's been circulated focuses on the very largest oil producers, who in many cases are already under investing in oil in order to build more solar panels and windmills. And these things are not replacements. And so they're already, they're contributing to the problem of world oil undersupply, and now they're gonna get punished. I mean, one, it's just like weird to direct it towards them. And then two, it seems incredibly unlikely to yield a positive outcome for really anyone. And then three, even if it did, was directed to all oil producers and it was implemented in some way where let's say it was a 10% tax like Italy's talked about, as various jurisdictions do that, you just reset the price of oil up 10%. And then you benefit companies that have bigger tax shields. I, I like companies like that uh, for obvious reasons. And you hurt companies that are more profitable. So you end up shifting economic activity towards, I mean, it's the, the typical economic deadweight loss idea where you have massive unintended policy consequences. Maybe they're intended for this, but it just seems, it doesn't seem very likely, again, for a kind of similar reason, like you're gonna end up with, uh, as you have windfall profit taxes, you just end up with higher gasoline prices real fast. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting to, to talk about windfall taxes in the oil and gas industry um when you look at you know some of the valuations on these these tech companies and it's just it, it's just totally different universes right now and, and especially when you know oil and gas uh investment is needed really for the infrastructure of the country um so i think it's unfortunate yeah i mean um, you, you have a you have a favorite like country a, sorry josh go ahead you look at like an Apple or a Google, right? I have like an Android phone. You look at Google's profits or Apple's profits. I mean, these are basically government sanctioned monopolies that raise their prices every year, uh, price monopolistically, um, generate enormous profits, pay almost nothing in tax. And they're talking about windfall taxes for US oil producers that who, you know, if you look at the relative employment, if you look at the relative reinvestment, I mean, it's just, it shows a very, it shows very bad policy, right? It's just not, if your goal is to maximize economic activity in your country and then maximize tax collection, I mean, that's the opposite. And again, you have to rely on bad policy mostly because that's what's been happening. But I think using this sort of criteria of what does this do to gas prices on any given day, US gasoline prices, generally for, energy policy, that's like a good starting point. And if it mm -hmm. lowers, if they took the windfall profits proceeds and 100% used them to subsidize US gasoline, I mean, again, it just would force oil prices up. It would be neutral for the producers and just very inflationary and dumb. But, you know, if, they, if they're not doing that, it seems unlikely because it's just going to force gasoline prices higher. So going back again to the structural, um, challenges that the industry face and the in the faces and the you know underinvestment in oil and gas it seems like this it creates a great opportunity for uh private capital investment and joe asked the question you know is this a great opportunity for private capital investment to try and bridge the gap with supply shortage uh, i think so i mean i've been doing it and uh you know i think i think there's great opportunities i think it's very risky and I think it's very important to do a lot of diligence. Um, you and I and some others were joking about, there's a, a questionable company that seems to be preying on this to some extent that's been advertising the permanent basin, which I think is a <laughs> was a mistake. They just didn't even know what they were talking about. The, the Permian Basin in West Texas and New Mexico has been a big source of incremental oil and gas supply over the last number of years. Um, when you know there's various criteria i think it's very very risky as an individual especially without a lot of expertise and and history in the oil and gas industry to go directly participate and invest in these sorts of things and so i just emphasize a great degree of caution i think it's a good idea generally but it's very difficult and there's a high probability of being scammed now um ross asked in line with this 
to the supply issues and uh, well, one more question after this. Um, how much relief would the Keystone pipeline provide? Uh, that on its own would help a little. I think it's it's less about any one thing and more about just this like long series of bad, the history of bad decisions have led us to this point. Yeah, yeah, it's not one. I mean, that would help, right? But you know, so would a number of different policies in the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere. And then in terms of like so-called safe jurisdictions, I don't think I think there's places I don't want to be where uh, I don't want to be in Russia right now. Um, for, for very obvious reasons, I don't want to invest in like Iranian oil production, but most other places have varying political risk and then varying valuations. And I think they're complicated and um, yeah, I wouldn't say I wouldn't invest in various other places, but places that I think are considered safe have proven not to be and places that are considered unsafe have actually been fairly stable uh, supply sources with fairly stable uh, fiscal and tax regimes. So. Um, you know, I think it's kind of hard to predict a little bit, and I'd be wary of someone guaranteeing safety, and I'd also um, try to avoid finding too much political risk outside of places where there's increasing sanctions, for example, and just like a decent chance that as like a U.S. investor, you might not actually own the thing that you think you own. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, I just have one last question, Josh. Um, you know, I understand that in addition to institutional capital and endowments, you also invest for qualified individuals. How should people that are interested get in touch with you? Yeah, so so none of this is a solicitation. I'm not doing. I'm just helping to try to educate people. Uh, you know, it's easy to to find us, call us, drop us an email. Um, you know, we we do accept money from qualified investors, and um, you know there there are various criteria for that. But the goal of this isn't that. And you know, I appreciate you asking that. But really, the idea is just there's a lot of interest in the oil and gas space right now. It's helpful to I think provide your clients and others with an update, and then you know. Uh, also, just to emphasize caution, again, like I think people are looking at these sort of individual investments without really understanding a lot of the risks and mm -hmm. without the experience of losing money in oil and gas for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to avoid uh, some of these things. You know, I guess I'm fortunate to have made lots of mistakes over time, and that's uh, allowed me to make fewer of those same mistakes going forward. Right. Awesome. Well, Josh, I really appreciate you being uh, here with us today. Uh, you added a lot of value to a lot of people. Um, and, you know, there's a, a waiting list of questions. So, you know, I encourage folks to hit Josh up. He's very active on Twitter. He's part of Energy Finance uh, Twitter, which is a, a group of executives that are very active on there. And Josh, thank you very much. Uh, Josh Young, Chief Investment Officer of Bison Interest. Thanks a lot, Zach. Thanks, guys.